Hello, hello. Welcome to the next installment of the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Networks Liberating Webinars series. I am extremely excited for today's discussion on cultural work, visual art, and disability justice. As you are joining, you should know that you are able to access, access captioning either by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen, choosing to display subtitle or open the full transcript in the sidebar, or to access captioning by clicking the link that we've pasted into the chat for the stream text, which is available in a separate window in your browser. We also have interpretation available on screen. If you are having any trouble with interpretation or other communication access, please let us know and we will do our best to try to address the issue in real time because we believe that everyone should have communication and language access. And uh, we wanna make sure that we are attending to each of your access needs. If you are on social media, please feel free to share this conversation and talk about what is happening today with our hashtag liberating webinars. We've placed that hashtag as well as the social media handles of our guests today in the chat box that you can reference it. And we invite you to share a little bit about yourself in the chat. Now, without further ado, let me introduce myself. My name is Lydia XC Brown, pronouns they, them, sign name L Brown. I am a youngish East Asian person with short black and teal hair and glasses. Today, I'm wearing a gray t-shirt and behind me is a fake screen that shows a bunch of blades of grass that is definitely magnified like times a thousand. Because if grass was actually that large, I might be a little bit afraid of what is happening and what movie we are in and if we can escape it, please. I am AWN's Director of Policy, Advocacy and External Affairs and your usual host for the Liberating Webinar Series. Today, I am extremely excited to introduce our guests. First, I'd like to introduce Ashanti Fortson, an award-winning cartoonist, illustrator, editor, and professor with a deep interest in difficult emotions, quiet moments, and the rifts and connections between human beings. Their work explores transience and reflection through a tender-hearted lens, and depicting the vastness and variety of human experience is one of their foundational principles. Ashanti lives in Baltimore with their spouse, their cat, Miss Cheese, and at least three pet rats at all times. And I would love to see any of your flukes appear if they happen to make an appearance today, kitty or ratties. Next, I'd like to introduce our second guest, Micah Bazant, a visual artist and cultural strategist who works with liberation movements to reimagine the world. For over a decade, they have created collaborative art inspired by struggles to decolonize ourselves from white supremacy, patriarchy, ableism, and the gender binary. They are a settler on Ohlone land, so-called Berkeley, California, and love growing food, reading speculative fiction, and admiring caterpillars, which are very fuzzy and cute. I'm also particularly excited for both of you to join us today because as I've shared with you, but not with our participants and community members who are here now, both of your art deeply is inspiring to my own and art that to me reflects the forefront of artistic work and the struggles for disability justice and queer and trans liberation. So I am so glad that you have agreed to join us today. And with that, I will be turning it over to you, Ashanti, to share a little bit about your work. All right. Thank you so much, Lydia. I am very excited to be here. Um, as Lydia mentioned, I am an illustrator and cartoonist. Um, I also wanted to add that my pronouns are they and them. And I'm going to open up and share my presentation that goes over a little bit of my work and the way that I approach the way that I approach um, disability justice and cultural um, cultural work in my art. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and give me one second as I sort out this. Okay, we're going to go right in. 
please let me know if the um, if the presentation is appearing correctly. Um, good to go. Thank you, Micah. If anyone has uh, any issues seeing the presentation, please let me know. So, um, primarily, I am a cartoonist, but I'm going to start off with some of my uh, illustrative work to give you a sense of um, what my work looks like and the types of things that I'm interested in exploring. One of those things is embroidery um, for personal enjoyment, as you can see right here. But I really enjoy exploring uh, fantastical and familial, homey and majestic, the whole kind of spectrum of, of themes and tones, all with a focus on color. Um, color for me is a very important part of how I perceive the world and how I experience the world. Um, I have synesthesia and a lot of that makes its way into my work. Um, I've also done a number of um, kind of commercial illustrative projects for tabletop role-playing games as on the left, Songs for the Dusk cover um, and book plates on the right. I enjoy in my illustrative work, a mix of fantasy, whimsy, um, botanicals and architecture. But today I want to mostly talk about comics. So um, oh, I'm a slide early. This is a Google Doodle I did uh, <laughs> celebrating um, the birthday of the man who started the Paralympics. Um, now on to comics. So, I have been doing comics for a long time now. Um, I started making comics in my first year of undergrad, uh, which was a long time ago in 2014, I believe. Um, and so that's, that's almost eight years now, I think, math. Um, this was one of the first pieces that I did on the topic of my experiences with disability and was a real um, kind of opening point for me when it came to exploring topics of my experiences, uh, other experiences, um, disability, disability justice, disability representation, um, and how all of those intersect with each other and with my experiences as a, um, as a queer person, as an Afro-Latino person, um, and more. So this was done for the nib. Uh, this is an excerpt from the comic I did for the publication, the nib, um, talking about my experience growing up autistic and kind of building this perception of myself as, um, a robot in my, um, interactions with other people and through the imagery of the iron giant from, um, the titular movie as well. Um, but from there, I, I kept exploring themes of disability, but tried to kind of move it away from myself a little bit and um, began exploring um, these themes in fiction. So I was commissioned by Bitch Magazine um, to create a piece about Instagram, which was a very kind of wide open prompt. And I, I wanted to use the opportunity given the magazine's platform to really talk about something that I had found through online spaces, which was disability community. And um, so I wrote a six page comic. These are two pages from it, um, talking about these two characters who are in um, in different spheres of kind of the Instagram um, experience. I don't use Instagram too, too much, but these are characters who do. Um, and through their interactions and growing friendship, finding commonality and um, comfort through each other against issues of cultural appropriation and um, not seeing oneself reflected in uh, fashion specifically. So um, one of the characters feels 
affected by the amount of um, the amount of able-bodied white-centric fashion and kind of aesthetics co-opting their culture and the other character um, feels similarly about the predominance of white thin models in fashion and they, they kind of share their ideas and um, experiences together and come up with with a brown black disability focused um, hashtag event essentially um, to other pages non-sequential pages uh, rather non-consecutive pages from that comic um, and the comic sort of ends in a lot of different disabled people sharing photos of, the, of themselves and their um, in their kind of disability centric chronic illness centric comfy couture quote unquote fashion um, so that was this was kind of the the first bigger um, project where I got to explore a lot of these ideas through fiction um, in comic form. And I found it to be a really a really valuable experience personally in, in terms of wanting to push my art increasingly in that direction. Um, this is another example of my work. Um, this is a short comic called Leaf Lace, um, which centers around an immortal goddess who has to process her spouse's, um, her mortal spouse's impending death. And so kind of uh, not, not necessarily disability focused in its topics, but I wanted to use this one as a segue to uh, something that I've discussed a lot with um, with peers in the comics community and, and specifically being a disabled person in comics, um, something that acts as a, as a gatekeeping kind of barrier is timeline and kind of publication speed in, in publishing. So it's very common in comics publishing for the timelines to be very fast. Um, and because of the nature of comics, the workload is very heavy. It's very labor labor heavy. Um, so those things result in in gatekeeping out a lot of disabled creators. Um, it's something that I've run into in the past with publishers, but one of the reasons I've put this one here, this this piece, was that this was the first major piece where I had kind of as much time as I needed to complete the project. And I found that it really affected in a positive way what the outcome of the piece was. Um, I took the time that I needed to complete it and wasn't rushed at any point by my editor, which I sincerely very much appreciated. Um, this comic ended up winning the Ignatz Award last year for uh, Outstanding Comic and was nominated um, in the same year for uh, Outstanding Artist and Outstanding Online Comic. So um, I'm glad that I had the time that I needed to complete it. And a lot of my advocacy work in comics has been kind of pushing for, for longer timelines, both for everybody, because nobody, nobody benefits from a breakneck speed in comics. Um, no one who's who's drawing the comics and specifically for disabled creators a lot of a lot of the pressure is removed when publishing timelines and production timelines are much more open and much more flexible to account for not only the things that come up in life and the work involved in comics but also are there any access needs required by the people working on the project um, because writers and artists and colorists and everyone working on a comic is a human being. And especially if those people are disabled, their needs come first over the timeline of the project. Um, 
that has been a very important principle to me and is something that I'm trying to implement in projects that I'm now working on as an editor um, for small press purposes. So another kind of step in that has been the graphic novel that I'm currently working on, Crescent Petra, for HarperCollins. And um, this is a story that focuses on Cress, an autistic uh, non-binary teenager who develops a friendship with an autonomous android asking lots of questions about life. Um, and I've gotten a chance to draw a lot of pages where they're experiencing, where Cress, the main character, is experiencing sensory overload, as in these pages. And it's been, it's been in a way a very refreshing experience to depict these things that are so central to my reality, but that I don't see depicted often in media, um, certainly not by autistic creators. So I've been able to really take my time with this project as well because of uh, my editorial team knowing that I am disabled and understanding that I'm disabled and making accommodations for me and what I need. Um, and that's something I'd really like to see more of in publishing. Um, let's see, oh, I skipped the page, let me go back. These are two other pages from the same project. They're not finished. None of, none of these four pages that I've shown are finished. They're what we call the pencils stage, which is kind of like a, a rough sketch before going to final. Um, so a lot of the book kind of handles topics of um, being autistic and undiagnosed and not knowing that you're autistic. Um, and kind of having those questions come up through your experiences with the world around you. Um, finally, I want to share uh, briefly the comic I worked on with um, Marike Nishkamp um, for DC's Wonderful Women of History um, on, the, on the story of Judy Human and the 504 sit-in. So these are two pages. Um, Marika did a lot of motif building with kind of passing the baton and uh, tracing the history of the disability justice and disability rights movement, um, specifically highlighting moments through the years, through the decades that have been central and uh, linking that to the story of the 504 sit-in. Um, my computer likes to skip pages. So th these are unlettered pages because I did not do the lettering. So it's just the, the artwork, but you can see still the, the events of the sit-in here and um, different people involved and uh, the involvement of the Black Panthers as well. Um, these are, excerpt pages, so not in sequential order. Finally, um, leading up, passing the baton all the way to 1989, 2008, and now passing the baton to the viewer. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of my work in these pages and elsewhere um, is focused on disability justice in the context of, I, I hesitate to say representation because it doesn't, that's not quite what I'm aiming for, but um, showing our experiences as disabled people on the page and showing us in many different contexts. So in, in nonfiction, in autobio uh, work, in fantasy work, in science fiction work, um, in uh, other kinds of fiction, fictional uh, stories, just kind of everywhere in the world as we are. Um, so in doing so, I want to encourage both disabled and non-disabled viewers, readers, people to understand what integral part of the world we are. And, um, and that our experiences are important and that we're not alone. I think it's a lot of a lot of what it comes down to for me is showing people that they're not alone and that there are other people like them. 
Um, that's what I've got for, for my presentation. I worry that I might have gone a little bit over, so I'll go ahead and wrap it up now. I'll stop sharing and um, pass it on over. This is Lydia. Thank you so much for sharing all of your work, Ashanti. I love seeing the pencils that you're working on. And, you know, one of the points that you made towards the end of your presentation, that, you know, representation isn't necessarily the exact right word or the frame, because we know that representation doesn't necessarily always translate into material change, let alone move us toward liberation. But at the same time, representation can be incredibly powerful can be truly validating for many of us who are at the margins and can indicate the possibility of our condition shifting to allow for a change in imagination and of what we believe is possible to imagine and therefore to build. So thank you again for sharing that. And now we'll turn it over to Micah. Thank you, um, that was amazing. Um, I am just going to share a little bit about my lineage, um, and then I'll share some slides. Uh, please tell me if I need to slow down. Also, um, I am going to talk about some of my movement work against um, violence, genocide, some heavy things. So please take care of yourself as you need to. Um, I've been making art with social justice movements for over 15 years. I come to this work through many artists and organizers who supported me and saved my life. Folks like Miss Major, Patty Byrne, Lewis Wallace, Miriam Kaba, many more, and movement artists who were my possibility models, who gave me my first bootleg font CDs and helped me print my first posters like folks at Oakland's Design Action Collective, Dignidad Rebelde, and Center for Cultural Power. And those folks were inspired and taught by the Black and Chicanx arts movements. So I share my work with you today from a place of deep gratitude and humility, knowing we're all trying to figure it out together. I'm a... 49-year-old, disabled, trans, Jewish, anti-Zionist artist. My father was born in Warsaw in 1927 and grew up in hiding in Nazi Europe. My mother's family is from Lodz and all my extended family was murdered by Nazis. So my parents escaped as child refugees to Australia and the US, two settler colonial nations that were allowing some European Jews to enter because they wanted more people who could become white. My family, my surviving family, internalized the Nazi belief that in order to be worthy of life, you must be smart and sane and productive and normal. And if there was something wrong with you, if you're disabled or racially or biologically impure or trans, you don't deserve to live. My father escaped the Nazis and he became a eugenicist. He became a doctor and he developed some of the first screening tests for fetal abnormalities or um, disabilities so people could end these defective pregnancies. So especially right now, I want to emphasize that abortion rights should be inviolable. And as you know, we cannot understand the development and use of these technologies outside of racism, ableism, and eugenics. So I share this with you as context Given this legacy, it's been incredibly healing for me to work with disability justice organizers. A lot of my work revolves around the questions, who is worthy of life, of dignity? What parts of ourselves have we tried to kill to survive? And how can we refuse to abandon each other? Now I'm going to try and share my screen. 
Let's see. Sorry, this is taking a minute. There we go. Did that work? Woohoo. Okay. Oops, no, that's not working. Okay, great. So um, this is a little image I made with the organization Sins Invalid, which is a disability justice performance project that I've worked with for about a decade. Um, this is a little image we made together during the 2014 Israeli massacres on Gaza. And it was a collaboration with my friend and sibling, family, heart family, Patty Byrne, who is one of the founders of the disability justice movement. And I intentionally made this in a very quick and sketchy style to try and experiment with imperfection. We made it to express solidarity with the Palestinian freedom struggle and to bring attention to disablement as a tactic of genocide, both by Israel and the US. Um, disablement by war, torture, poisoning the land and the water, um, by Ismi Israeli military practices like kneecapping, where they permanently disable Palestinian youth by shooting out their knees. Um, and the Israeli captain said, I will make half of you disabled and let the other half push the wheelchairs. So in the face of these horrors, this was a small, beautiful and powerful act of global solidarity between folks who are so often left behind. One of the intergenerational trauma survival strategies drilled into me growing up was to trust no one and that friendship isn't real. The idea is that friendship is a lie because if you're starving in a boxcar and there's only one apple, your so-called friend will kill you to get that apple. In Judaism, as in many traditions, we understand time as non-linear and that healing and knowledge flow back and forth across generations. Part of my struggle in this life is to learn how to be a better friend, to save each other's lives, and to help my ancestors finally leave that boxcar. I understand friendship as one of the most powerful transformative forces in my life, and most of my work is based in collaborative friendships. Civil rights leader Ella Baker asked us, who are your people? When I sit with this question, my heart answers, people fighting genocide are my people. Both as a Jew and a US citizen, um, Israeli genocide is carried out in our name with billions of US tax dollars. So this is another image um, I made in 2014 um, that is sadly just as relevant today. The central plant is the saber, also called nopal or prickly pear cactus, originally from Mexico. And when I was in Palestine, I learned about it as a symbol of indigenous resilience and resistance. The saber are used as natural fences and they're unstoppable. They grow up again where Israeli bulldozers have flattened entire towns and they show a ghost map of destroyed Palestinian homes. They inspire us that terror and apartheid of Zionism can end and free Palestine can rise just like the beautiful Saber. A lot of my earlier work was fulfilling asks for memorial portraits from trans and disabled organizers of color. In 2015, the San Francisco police killed a young black disabled man named Mario Woods and folks in the local Black Lives Matter chapter reached out to me to create a memorial portrait. And that's generally a situation where I'm so honored to be asked and there's a lot of time pressure. So I drop whatever I'm doing to try and make it happen as soon as possible. But I knew we couldn't move forward on this portrait without my disabled comrades and family at Sins Invalid. So I asked if they'd all be open to working on it together which required us going slower, but we made something very needed that had not existed before. And it led to cross disability conversations between organizers that would not have happened otherwise. This is an image that taught me how art has its own life. It's a portrait of disabled trans ancestor, Marsha P. Johnson. 
I made it in 2013 when very few people knew about Marsha to express my disgust with the white supremacist corporate beer fest that Pride had become and to reclaim the radical abolitionist history of trans liberation. So all the words on this poster are by me. They actually are not quotes of Marsha, but the words spoke to people and they traveled. These are folks in Durham, North Carolina, uh, I think in 2014, um, folks from API Equality in San Francisco, uh, I think in 2014, um, and folks in Chicago interrupting Pride. So uh, these are just a few of many um, in real life, uh, in the streets examples. So, sorry, I lost my place. So this continued until now, people all over the world attribute these words to Marsha, which at first I felt so conflicted about. I felt like it wasn't historically correct and I didn't wanna be erased as an artist, but then a friend helped me remember that we owe Marsha everything. And what a great gift to learn to be in humility and offer up those words to her spirit. And this is an example of what cultural reparations are to me about letting go of concepts that don't serve us like individual ownership and remembering why we do the work so we can all get free. Um, I want to share some of my other failures and learnings. Uh, so often we only hear about people's successes. But last year, I had a hard realization about how I have left other people behind. I have so much pain and have done so much work uh, to repair the ways that mainstream LGB communities have abandoned trans folks, and especially have abandoned trans folks of color. But I had to realize that I had done the exact same thing, being completely ignorant of violence against intersex communities. And that while states are passing all these laws to prevent trans healthcare and life, they are simultaneously affirming the legal right of doctors in every state to non-consensually administer hormones, to, to intersex kids and to do medically unnecessary surgeries on intersex babies that cause lifelong disabling harm. So I reached out to Sean Saifa Wall, founder of the Intersex Justice Project to see how I could offer reparations and be of use. And through conversation, we created this em image that shows Saifa, full of joy, holding an intersex child who has not been subjected to the knife and who shows their intersex ancestors who carried their intersex DNA and lineage across the Atlantic and through enslavement. And when I collaborate with communities that I'm not a part of, we discuss that whatever we make together is coming into existence because of their life and their struggle, that they are the primary owners and can use the art however they want. They can sell it, print it, share it. In this case, IJP uses every poster sale to raise money for intersex activists in the global South. I want to talk a little bit about my work behind the scenes, trying to support other movement artists. The fact that some of my work of Marsha and with other trans organizations received so much attention is not unconnected to the fact that I'm a white artist um, who had the support and resources to do a lot of often unpaid work. And it pointed to a real need to support the work of trans artists of color. So seven years ago, I helped start the Trans Day of Resilience art project with the organization Forward Together and many other people. It supports Black, Indigenous, and people of color trans artists to celebrate trans people of color while they are alive. Because, of course, we cannot only cherish the Marshas of the past, we need to support all the Marshas of today. We did national open calls for BIPOC trans artists, paid them really well, and supported them with a whole team to help them grow as artists, 
learn to print and sell their art and make it blow up on social media, exhibit it, distribute it nationally. This project helped launch many careers and I'm grateful to say that many of these artists are still my friends and teachers. We sent the art to thousands of trans youth, trans folks in prison and grassroots trans organizations. And I'm especially proud of our work with GSA Network. They work with LGBTQI students in high schools and middle schools across the country. So we wanted to help break the isolation of so many of these students and plug them into the national network so they could get skilled up as organizers and meet other youth who are doing the same work. So we offered this art as an incentive to joining the network. And as a result, we doubled their national membership. Last month, I actually spoke in a friend's college class and one of the students had been in one of these high school GSA clubs that received the art. And they said to me, how did you know that that's what we needed? How did you know that we would need the art? And I said, we know because we are you. We were trans youth and trans art saved our lives. And the meaning of this art is that you have a place in the world and we want you to live. I wanna share just two more stories about this project. This is Jocelyn Beyonce. She is an asylum seeker from Nicaragua. She's holding a poster that's a collaboration between my dear friend, artist Romy Torico, who is a formerly undocumented trans artist and the organization Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement. Jocelyn Beyonce crossed six borders to get to the US. When she was in Mexico, she was kidnapped and they threw acid on her. And when she arrived in the US, ICE kidnapped her. She spent months imprisoned in the Civil Ed Trans Detention Center. And she finally won her asylum case and immediately started renting out a house in Albuquerque where she could house other trans people getting out of detention. We sent an art care package to her and to hundreds of similar places to remind them that trans liberation is beautiful and reflect their abundant borderless visions for liberation. This is my friend, Ashley Diamond. She's a young black trans woman who has been caged and tortured in men's prisons in Georgia for the last 10 years. She's endured ongoing assaults by prisoners and guards. When she first went into prison, she had been in, on hormones for 17 years. And prison officials placed her in solitary confinement for pretending to be a woman. They stopped her hormones, forcing her to medically detransition and causing her to attempt suicide and self-harm. When I was able to meet Ashley five years ago, she said to me on the phone, oh, I know who you are. When I was in solitary, I saw your art in the newsletter. It was so beautiful and it gave me strength. And I decided I was going to survive and get out of here. And one day you would paint my portrait too. So this is why we live, to save each other's lives, to refuse to abandon each other, and to leave the boxcar together. Thank you. This is Lydia. <clears throat> Thank you so much for sharing about all of your work, Micah. And also for helping to set an example in our community of what it means to take accountability for realizing when we've fallen short and either caused harm or been complicit in harm. We don't have enough of those examples available to us. And, you know, I really appreciate being able to be in community with people who are practicing what it means to take accountability, whether that happens in public because the harm has been public or whether that's happening in private because that's actually where the accountability needs to be happening. You know, we have a, just a little bit of time left together today and you 
spoken both brilliantly to the impact of your work on disability justice organizing and how your organizing work has informed the type of artwork that you create through comics, through illustrations, um, through curated art projects. I'm wondering if you would both be able to talk a little bit more explicitly, uh, maybe to those people who are involved in movement spaces, but who aren't necessarily thinking about what the importance of artwork is, what cultural work is, and why we need it in organizing why it's not superfluous or not something just pretty to look at. So I, I would love to jump in here. Um, I have lots of thoughts on this as an illustrator. Uh, for those who are um, less familiar with illustration as a format, um, illustration is often thought of as like line based drawings or um, like line and color or that sort of thing, a stylistic uh, direction. But illustration is defined more broadly as art that communicates an idea. Um, and that's often how I think about art as, as communication, as movement, as justice, as advocating for those things and more. Um, visuals in, in, you know, the most kind of, um, technical clinical way, which is not how I feel about it. Um, visuals make people look in a more emotional way. Art makes people understand art makes people think art makes people realize, um, Art makes people question, art makes people connect. And that can be, oh, I hadn't thought about this before. I hadn't thought about this, this kind of perspective before. I hadn't thought that things could be like this before. It can be, oh, I'm not alone. There are people like me, or I want to look that beautiful, or I want to, I want to be this, I want to be that. I want to change my life. I want to change other people's lives. Um, I want to change things. Art is in both process and effect. Um, I would say one of the ultimate embodiments of change and process, um, just like we are ever evolving as humans and as human communities and human societies, art is a manifestation of that through our human hands that make art. Um, and art has that effect on other people. So uh, I, I see all of that contextualized within movements for change as the opportunity for art to communicate, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? What am I experiencing? What do we want for us, for you, for everyone? And sending that message visually to other people who might not otherwise connect or might not otherwise understand that there is another possibility out there, that there are other worlds out there, that there are other communities out there, that, um, that there is something that they can fight for too. I think that, that art is uh, in any format, whether it be illustration or animation or music or you know the, the vast array of, of art and in this case specifically visual art um it's it's pure potential and that makes it so powerful as a as a message sender and as a as a form of connection um i hope that answers and addresses the question because i just found myself going off track <laughs> this is lydia as an autistic person from the northeast i can't judge like the ADD also just really amplifies the I have an idea and what started as one idea just transformed into 250 other ideas that are technically connected somehow and then I want to share all of them but most people are not probably interested in the ideas past number five uh, but thank you very much for for sharing that and I really agree with you that 
you know, what we create and make available to the world can be very powerful. Um, and especially in that power of possibility and the power of making real um, what it is that we imagine and what we believe is present in our liberation. Um, Micah, would you like to speak a little bit about this too? I think what Ashanti said is perfect and um, what I believe as well. I Another thing I've been thinking about as our governments um, just continue to move to the right is how um, for those of us in the movement, like as the windows of what is possible legislatively, electorally, um, judicially narrow, I think that the arts play a particularly strategic and important role. This is Lydia. Um, I would, you know, agree, right, that, you know, we can be pushing for change in ways that seem tangible and recognizable in the legal or policy landscape, but those changes probably aren't bringing us toward liberation. And the work of organizers and activists is often to challenge the bounds of what becomes possible. I know that I keep returning to that theme, but uh, it's it's so important to me and my work and the work AWN does is many of our conversations, you know, other people will dismiss as that's too radical or that's too extreme or don't you think that you're asking for too much and are people going to actually listen to you and take you seriously? And the reality is, if we don't ask for what we know our communities need, if we're not asking for abolition, if we're not asking for food and housing for everyone, if we're not asking for land back, then how are we ever going to change the parameters of the conversation? How are we ever going to introduce the possibility of the liberation we seek? if we accept that the bounds of the conversation as they exist now will always remain where they are. And, you know, I think the work that both of you are doing and what you both shared with us already is part of helping push a more radical set of demands and visions forward into the public sphere. People are a lot more responsive to art and comics and fiction than they often are to you know, hearing someone talk for an hour about the theory behind liberatory movements or an hour about like some policy change and the details and intricacies of that policy implementation. I think I made myself yawn a little bit, just saying that out loud. And you know, we, we need folks who can do work in that way. But I think what gets people's attention a lot is what we create artistically. And that helps to teach us too. If I can say one last thing, this is Ashanti. Um, on that, on that note, Lydia, um, it's it's so interesting to think about how the how the pushback to radical demands comes up. Like, oh, you that's that's too extreme, as you were saying. Um, what is very promising to me and I think at the core of how I see things is that the parameters of the conversation are set by human beings um, because that's who's in the conversation you know that the systems are made by, by people the conversations are made by people and that means that people can change those conversations that means that people can change those systems because people made those systems in the first place um, so it's it's so possible to, to change those and to shift them or to abolish them, to eradicate them, to build them up again, different, and to build and protect, build, build new systems that protect people of all kinds and, um, and to start conversations that will lead there. Um, I think that you know, there's a reason that so many people have um, have used the phrase a conversation piece in response to a piece of art, uh, to a, a painting or a sculpture or what have you, um, because art gets people talking. And sometimes that that in is 
what needs to be there for people to engage with ideas that that they might find difficult or challenging or complicated or new. Um, I think art is is so beautiful for that reason of here's an idea, how do you respond to it? Let's have a conversation. This is Lydia. <clears throat> Thank you for adding that offering and right, like art makes people have conversations or as in the case of um, the artwork with the that was turned into a poster of me, apparently it also generates like an entire local scandal in Wisconsin schools uh, that uh, Kate DiCiccio had, had, had created that artwork. As, and Micah, I know you were part of the same project that I'm referencing. Um, art can generate conversation, also protests, also minor news scandals. Um, you know, I do want to make sure that folks who are here from our community have a chance to ask you questions. So if any of you have questions that you would like to ask our guests, please add them right into the chat. And I'll try to ask some of those questions if you have them. In the meantime, while people have their thoughts percolating, can I ask you both, you know, what is coming next for you? And I really do mean that to include all possibilities of, of what that might be, including saying absolutely no, not doing any work and I'm lying down for the next two months. Um, what is next for you? How can people support you in whatever that might be? Um. I, well, you know, I actually, right, I'm, I just am able to start making art again, because I have had tendonitis for eight months, drawing related tendonitis for eight months. So I'm just so thrilled to be able to make things again. And um, I am working on my first kids book with uh, Miriam Kaba and Jane Ball an abolitionist kids book. So um, that's very exciting and scary. And um, I am also just, uh, yes, excited. I, yes, it's true. We've all learned so much from Miriam. And um, I'm also excited to do more art around um, climate collapse. So just to, to work with more climate justice organizations. My, my what's next is actually a little bit similar on that last note. Um, I, uh, Earth Day was, was I think two days ago. Um, I did a short comic um, commissioned by NPR uh, based on the words of Zia Bastida, um, a youth climate activist and organizer. Um, I've been, I had been working on that comic for uh, several months, but in the process of doing so, it, it, really, um, it really showed me internally how much I wanted and needed to uh, work with and for, yep. Yes, Lydia, uh, Zia Bastida in chat. Um, and um, how much I needed to start working with and for um, climate activists and climate advocates. So that's something that I am planning on um, donating my time towards um, and kind of working towards doing more of that. Um, in, in other kind of avenues, I am currently working on my graphic novel from which I posted those penciled pages, Crescent Petra, um, as well as another um, unannounced currently graphic novel, novel, which I think since this is not public social media, I can quiet, quietly, quietly. Uh, oh, Shanti, before yes. you say that, we yes. are streaming live to Facebook. So okay. technically this is public. We can hide our video later if the two of you decide you okay. want it to be. I'll, 
for a bit. But just so you're aware, this is live on Facebook. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that for that notice. I will not say what book it is. <laughs> you all will have to find out. Um, it's 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 related to an artist with um, who lives with with disability and showcase that in their work. That's all I'll say. <laughs> um, and I am planning a little bit of a not career change, but a career shift um, to focus more on um, volunteer artwork and. Uh, activist artwork and not taking on as much commissioned work. So that's what's next. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, for both of you. And uh, really glad to have you um, and to know that you're working on um, on all of the projects that you are working on that are just rooted in community and rooted in collective power. Uh, we have a question from Abigail David who says, how do you not get overwhelmed by fear of how rights are being taken away? How do you find the hope to keep moving forward? Um, I can respond to that. I, um, you know, when I spent time in Palestine, um, we met with someone who was on the negotiating team for the uh, between the Palestinian and Israeli governments. And he'd been doing this for years. And I asked him that a version of that question. And he said to me, um, you know, I do not have hope in an emotional sense. Um, hope is a practice and that we know that conditions can change at any moment. Um, through years and decades and even centuries of resistance that he referenced the black liberation struggle that, you know, whoever knew that slavery would finally end, that South African apartheid would finally end and um, how that uh, sustains him. And of course, Miriam Kaba, you know, also has a very aligned saying that hope is a discipline. So I would say that, yeah, I don't, I actually do not have hope in an emotional sense. I think that um, climate collapse is here and things are, are very scary. And um, the future is, um, it's going to be rough, but I think that I am committed to um, the gifts of this life. Like we, we've been given gifts. And so we have a responsibility to share those gifts with the earth and with each other. I'll quickly add on um, first that everything Micah said, I also feel very strongly. Um, and that in the face of rights being taken away legally and and socially and um, judicially, we keep us safe is what I keep coming back to. Um, and building building community, finding community, whether it's large or small is what keeps me grounded. Um, and ho hope is, is a, is not a feeling that I have either in, in my heart in terms of an emotional experience of, of hope. Um, but hope is a decision that I make every morning. I'll put it like that. I'm resonating so much with what both of you are saying about that. And, um, you know, I've had people describe me both as, oh, you, you offer so much hope. And I'm like, but do I? I'm a very pessimistic person. And also say, oh, well, you just sound so hopeless. And I'm like, am I? Because I'm doing a lot of work in community to try to bring about the future we dream of. Um, we have another question here from Taylor Lane, who says, this is more about the genre of your art specifically. But I've noticed in both of your works that there is realism and speculative fantasy elements, etc. Do you have a preference for one or the other? Do you think speculative art allows you 
to uh, allows you more avenues towards transformative justice than realism or vice versa? I can jump into this one first. This is Ashanti. Um, so on a, on a personal level, the answer is very simple for me. I, I love drawing fantasy, uh, speculative genre work. Um, as an artist, that brings me a lot of uh, a lot of um, energy and excitement and fun. Um, I also think that um, speculative work allows for tremendous avenues towards, um, at the very least, questioning the current systems, the current status of things, the current ways that things are done. Um, I think about Ursula K. Le Guin's work all the time um, with regards to speculative fiction and how, how it can be used to start going somewhere um, in terms of theory, in terms of thinking about the status quo, in terms of um, personal understandings of concepts related to justice and society and, and whatnot. Um, I also think that there is a an undeniable power in work that depicts us as we are in the world um, and that is grounded in the world we live in. Um, I think that there there is a balance between the two that it that um, is sometimes more suited for certain ideas, sometimes more suited for other ideas. I'm thinking about it in terms of a story that tells this or a story that tells that or a book that's about this, because I um, I think a lot in narrative and my work is primarily in narrative. Um, so that's kind of how I'm, how I'm approaching this question. Some stories and ideas and concepts and interrogations of, of certain ideas um, can be really effective through a speculative lens. Um, some can be even more effective through a kind of contemporary or, or realistic lens. Um, some even mo more effective through a mix of both. I think a lot about magical realism and um, the way that genre exists as an expression of um, Central and Latin American and South American struggles against colonialism and genocide and uh, histories of those things. Um, based in actual events expressed through a lens of, of fantasy that describes the, the unreality and the surrealism of the horrors that, that people have endured over the centuries. Um, and that's, that's a genre that expresses, um, expresses that experience in a unique and powerful way. Um, so, I, I, I love it all. I think it's all great <laughs> in summary. We have one last question from Sarah Kohler, who says, thank you so much for all that you do. I've been thinking a lot recently about how each of our, as individuals, actions can feel small in the face of issues that we face. I am passionate about art and inclusion and kindness and advocacy and have been for as long as I can remember. But implementation has largely been in my own life through a job in healthcare, as a student, as a friend, et cetera. My question is, what would you say to people who want to get involved in art and advocacy? but are maybe unsure of what to do and how to quote unquote, get started. Um, great, I think joining an organization is great. So you're here, so you're already connected to one organization. Um, you know, how I came to this work was, you know, people like Miss Major who just saw like, oh, you like to draw. And she would give me little assignments like, baby, can you make a postcard for the girls in prison? And can it have this kind of lady with this kind of hat, you know, and um, just like doing little things that 
actually are not so little or very meaningful. Just, just try different assignments and figure out where in that Venn diagram of what's needed, what your skills are, and what you love to do, what's in the middle. And I'm also always very happy to talk to people who want to figure out how to, you know, do things similar to what I do. So feel free to email me or reach out to me on Instagram. Ashanti, did you want to add anything to Sarah's question? I think Micah gave the best answer possible. I will, I will kind of emphasize the point that reaching out to people is, is key. Never feel, oh no, what if they don't want to, what if, what if they don't want my email? What if, what if I'm not needed? What if I, um, what if I'm not good enough? What if I'm not skilled enough? Everybody is needed. There is always stuff to be done and everyone is, is welcome to, to join in any effort, whatever, whatever movement, whatever organization, whatever cause, whatever thoughts you're having, reach out, reach out is, is always, you know, the, the major step and it can be anxiety inducing, but that's, no one will be unhappy to receive your, your offer of, of help and participation. Thank you again to both of you for joining us today, Ashanti and Micah. Thank you to our interpretation team for their work today, to our captioner, and to AWN staff and team members, including Nancy and Kaylee and Catherine, for all of their work to make this webinar series possible. If you are celebrating, I hope you are having a fantastic Orthodox Easter. I hope that the end of Passover has been a time of joy and rejuvenation for you. And I hope that you have a generous fast if you are currently fasting for Ramadan. Thank you for your time with us. And we hope to see you soon for the next event in the Liberating Webinar series. Please stay tuned on AWN's website and social media for announcements about the next events to come.